everybody, and welcome to the GMI Hub Online. Today we're going to talk about fundraising. That's right. Talking about trying to get your dough together, raising some funds. It's really important. We have two amazing guests today. And uh, so I want you just to relax and enjoy yourselves as we tackle this conversation of um, fundraising. And my name is Dale Borland. And I'm Cheryl Duick. And we're so pleased to have all the way from England, we have Andy Baker, who is a singer. He's a songwriter. He's an artist manager. He is uh as he describes himself the salmon cowl of christian music <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I don't i i don't describe myself as that i have been described as that oh <laughs> okay we'll let that go we're gonna let that go i i don't have high trousers and his hair his hair is much better than my hair. That tight t-shirt yeah you don't I've have had much less botox no, than no. <laughs> but um you are the founder of homegrown worship which is an initiative to encourage uh, artists to actually write Christian music and write worship music, as well as Rocket Fuel, which is a fundraising, or sorry, a crowdfunding platform for artists. So we are so happy to have you with us, Andy. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. As well, we have Elias Doomer, who is, uh, many of you will know from the City Harmonic, the lead singer, main songwriter, front man, however you want to describe him. But Elias, I thank you so much that you were able to be here with us. Oh, well. thanks for having me. Um, from the perspective of someone who actually runs a crowdfunding platform, Andy, how would you describe crowdfunding? Well, the first thing when talking about crowdfunding is it's easy to get confused. Now, there are two types of crowdfunding. There's people raising money for new companies, and that's what you might call equity crowdfunding. Now, we don't do that. We don't get involved with people raising money for their new widgets company or whatever it is. Uh, there are sites that do that. We work in reward based crowdfunding and that's where kind of supporters, so they could be friends, family, fans, or followers, they get behind uh, a project or an artist or someone with an idea. And those people can maybe buy things or subscribe or they can offer contributions, donations, um, and there's so many different sites. People might be familiar with things like Kickstarter, Indiegogo, GoFundMe, and they, they all have different kind of quirks and different ways of working. But essentially you're asking the crowd, you're asking the audience to help you to create a project or to do something or make something happen that otherwise would not happen without the support. Wonderful. Elias, you've used uh, several different crowdfunding platforms. Andy mentioned a few. Are those the ones that you've basically used? Yeah, I mean, we, we've been doing some form of crowdfunding for different projects since, I think, 2014. So uh, we ran a bus fundraiser on Kickstarter, then uh, an album release on Indiegogo, and then I more recently did another album release on Indiegogo back in 2018. So I've worked with those, now I have a Patreon. So yeah, I've, I've run the gamut, I guess. <laughs> Wonderful. So... One of the things I, I wanted to find out was um, now, and you run Rocket Fuel, and we were talking a little bit before uh, before we actually officially decided to to go live here. But um, how is Rocket Fuel different from the Kickstarters, Indiegogo, Patreons, and all the other crowdfundings that are out there? It's way better. Um, well, basically, <laughs> I, I I started crowdfunding in in twenty twelve, so I I go back even further than. Elias, who's a veteran of crowdfunding. Um, but I, I got really interested in crowdfunding because I'd worked in artist management and working alongside developing artists. And funding is is a huge issue for 90% of artists. It's it's a huge factor. It's a, it's it's massive. Um, so I did my first campaign in, in 2012. And then over over the course of two years, I did 26 campaigns um, across all kinds of different platforms. We, we looked at everything that was on the market. We worked with kind of new artists. We worked with people who'd never done a project before. We worked with people with, you know, fan bases. Um, and we saw there was a real gap. And, and what I found is, is people would run a crowdfunding campaign and sometimes it would be a bit hit and run. They'd ask their fans for money and then say, great, thanks for the money. Now we're, we're off and then they try getting their fans involved with something else. And there's this constant kind of migration of people from one platform to another platform 
to another platform. So the idea that we came up with for Rocket Fuel was really to give artists a ongoing dynamic way of crowdfunding. So they don't have to be constantly fundraising, but they, they have their fundraising in one place. So Rocket Fuel essentially is your online store. You can sell products, music, merchandise, experiences. We, we encourage artists, you know, to offer things at all kinds of price brackets. You know, you might have an online store with a CD for $10 or whatever it is, but as an artist, you want to be offering those high value experiences as well, the things that people might want to pay for, you know, write a song with me or come and spend a day in the studio. People will pay reasonable money or sometimes, you know, really good money. And that really helps the artist. So we give people an online store. And then when you want to switch on your goal, you can switch into mission mode. So you hit the button and you're raising money over a month or six weeks for a project. But then at the end of that, your store is still in place. Uh, and in addition to that, we have monthly subscription tiers as well. So people can get their supporters, friends, family, fans, followers to get behind them uh, on an ongoing basis and they get rewards in return for that. So we kind of bring together the online store, the Kickstarter, Indiegogo kind of campaigns, and also what Patreon do through subscription tiers as well. So that's kind of the USP in a way. Um, and the other side is we're, we're a music industry kind of enterprise. So we're not just a tech company, um, you know, working with lots and lots of people who are just numbers in a system to us. We're a very hands-on kind of artist development company. We work a lot with people in the Christian um, church and, you know, gospel musicians, all kinds of people who have, you know, a mission and a ministry with their music as well. So I think that's, that's a few of the things that we wanted to do that were quite quite different because as I said I'd, I'd used all the other platforms and and we'd had great success with them but I felt there was a bit of a gap in the market and that's what we tried to do with Rocket Fuel. Yeah it seems like a one-stop shopping one-stop shop for uh, artists yes? Yeah in, in many ways because yeah we we have a an artist development company we've run since 2010 called Sound Consultancy. I, I have worked in artist management but I'm I lost all my hair, as you can see, so I had to hang up my management boots. So it's quite a, quite a tiring job. But no, I, I had um, a lot of fun. I, I, I looked after a fantastic artist called Philippa Hanna, uh, who's now signed with Integrity. I, I looked after Philippa for 13 years. We traveled all around the world. I think we had 25 countries she went to, we booked a thousand thousand shows and, you know, did some incredible, incredible things with, with Philippa. Um, but I've also started a community homegrown worship as well. So we work with writers, artists, churches, sharing songs, um, you know, music production, distribution and stuff. So yeah, there's a kind of a range, a range of different things that we, that we help people with. Um, it's yeah, very, very innovative and, and fresh in a different, a different kind of enterprise. Now it sounds, it sounds like to me that if someone wants to start fundraising or crowdfunding, they need to have an established fan base. So what would you say to somebody who uh, doesn't have a fan base to draw from this finances? What would they do? The thing, the thing is, we, we just run a campaign with a, a guy called Tim. And uh, Tim lives quite locally to me in Gloucestershire, England. And Tim managed to raise £1,300. So that's, oh no, my exchange rate is going to go out here. That's, you know, 1600 US dollars. He raised that from 18 supporters. So the average supporter is worth a hundred dollars, not in every campaign, but that's not unusual. So, you know, if you, if you're giving your music away on Spotify for a third of a pence per stream, yes, you're going to need a huge crowd to generate revenue. But the thing with crowdfunding or like Elias uses Patreon, you know, when you get someone subscribing $10 a month, it adds up over a year or two years. And, so I think I think the thing with crowdfunding is you don't need a big you don't need a big fan base or following to generate a reasonable amount of revenue for a project. Obviously, the yeah. bigger the bigger the following, the better. Yeah, yeah we course. kind of teach the principle of you know if you imagine three circles, you have your crowd, which is the biggest circle, your community, which is in the middle, and the core right in the center. And your core followers can really get behind you some of these people might invest support you you know a hundred dollars two hundred dollars five hundred dollars a thousand dollars each year um, and when you add those together you don't need a huge core following to 
fund your new EP or your new mm. album. Um, so I think that's that's the thing we try and encourage people with. You don't need a huge fan base. Sorry to shut you down with the thumbs down there. Dan, well, but, no, know. I actually think that's really interesting too because um, even so, when the, all of the campaigns I've run have been after my, our career as an artist was already established. So while I'm indie now, I can hardly take any sort of indie darling claim because we were built in the traditional label system. So my career exists because of Universal Music Group and Kingsway. So I can't really like pretend that I built this from the ground. I didn't. We had a, we had an existing fan base when ours happened, but in every case, I've gone back and crunched the numbers and Andy and I've actually talked separately about this before. In every case, uh, for my campaigns anyway, where it was a timestamped campaign as opposed to an ongoing monthly campaign like a Patreon or what he's talking about, um, something like 60 or 70, if not maybe even 80% of the funds raised came from a handful of donors total. So yeah. the vast majority of the funds came from very few sources. And in my case, and this is sort of standard church fundraising best practices as well, um, the majority of those funds were actually arranged prior to going live with the campaign. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was a little, I, I, I don't want to say a show in a sense, but it was, it was really a building on momentum. And so the biggest benefit for me, I know this has been true for Tony Pitotto who runs food music as well. I know I'm sure Andy will agree with this as well is that one of the biggest benefits of crowdfunding is essentially like social impetus and marketing momentum, is that when people are invested in something, they feel excited about what it is. And so the truth is, I had you know a couple hundred donors on my first LP as a solo artist, right? Um, most of those financially didn't change the game. What did change the game was sort of the prearranged donors, the large sum donors that I were sort of networked more intentionally, you know? And the good, th the good news there is anyone can do that. Anyone can think of the 10 people in their life who really care and, and get those people invested in their career. The can, rest you break, of can you break that down for us? How would you go about taking an approach to those, partic those particular core people? How yeah, you well, I mean, I think, I think it, maybe it's a little, maybe I'm assuming too much, but it, it, it can be intuitive. Who are the 10 people who could and would I mean, like the people who, who, who have some sense of, maybe they're not rich, but they, you know, they're comfortable enough that they could invest in what you're doing. Or maybe they would give sacrificially to invest in what you're doing because they really believe in it. Most people could probably sit down and come up with a list of three to five, if they're being honest, people who really believe in them. I, I would say, I, I, I've never done what Andy's talking about, where, you know, I, you crowdfund your first record. I, it was just never something I did. So I don't, don't know but as an established artist at least even i do know even in my experience that it still comes down to those networked relationships to make basically in my, my my rule of thumb and advice i've given in the past is not to take a crowdfunding platform live and andy's i think you might end up disagreeing with me and i'd love to hear what you think um uh, I, this is fun okay so uh yeah so I would not take a crowdfunding campaign live until I had reached a certain threshold mentally of previously raised funds. Mm -hmm. So I would like, I would want to know that I had 30 or 40 or maybe even more than half of the money already arranged and then funnel that fundraising through the platform, even at a cost to myself, wow. because it creates a lot of, in other words, I'm paying now a processing fee and a percentage to the platform, even though I've arranged it offline. Do you see what I'm saying? Um, and the reason for that is the momentum it creates is astronomical. And that's people like to feel like they are backing something meaningful, that their thing makes a difference, which it does. And, and on top of that, generally strangers are more apt, strangers who've never heard of what you're doing are more apt to support something they perceive as a winning horse, if you will. So they kind of get behind what already appears to have momentum much more easily. And that rang true in, in the three kind of large campaigns. So we did one that was 75,000, and then two that were in the twenty and 30,000 range. So um, I don't have nearly the experience in terms of the volume of campaigns, but um, ours have been pretty successful. And in each case, we sort of prearranged some funds, went live when we felt confident that we had a foundation. And then with that foundation, momentum was much more easy to build. We've, I've never done a campaign where you've, you've kind of 
pre-arranged funds, but we, we, we teach a few different techniques when we work with artists in terms of planning their campaigns. And one of those is what we call kind of preloading. So the, the idea is, you know, if you're trying to get a song to hit the charts, you don't start promoting it at the day of release. Do you? That's right. That's you right. Plan, you plan months ahead, weeks ahead, and you, you work hard on it. So yeah, we, we totally teach people to speak personally to those core mm. supporters and those people, you know, who are really, you know, there's that depth of relationship or, you know, if you have an, an uncle with a huge mansion and a yacht, yeah, he might, right. be good, he might be good, might to, be good to talk to, to him. Personally. <laughs> Um, so we teach kind of preloading, but we've not really done like you say, like you say, you know, it's kind of a little bit staged, perhaps. I don't know. I've, I've, I, I see what you mean, and I, t I get the momentum, and you know. I, I mean, ultimately, I think we're talking about the same principle as that. It's just a question of if I've already planned out what the campaign is going to be, folks might ask, okay, what happens if I give a thousand? What happens if I give five thousand? So we'd have that conversation prior and then they would say do you want me to go outside the platform and i'd say no let's let's run through the platform when we go live um and yeah i suppose if you if you're open with that no one's gonna i think because the thing the, the thing with the all or nothing sites like kickstarter which, which is, is why i don't use kickstarter if you, if you don't hit your target you don't you lose the money i say you, lose right. the money, you never had the money but the supporters don't have their money taken right it, the, there is that real pressure of the the, de the deadline and the all or nothing thing. So I think yep. that, that, you know, that could be perceived as, I don't know, someone might say that's a bit manipulative if you, if you're staging it in some way or what, whatever, but it's staging in the sense that we're, you're networking an existing network and then not taking the money elsewhere. That's really all, all that I've, that yeah. I've done is I've just funneled it through there. Um, but yeah, again, part of it is in one, one other thing that we have done and this, this is not uncommon in uh, for other artists that I know who've gone from the label system to the sort of more independent fundraised system would be to, so let's say I was making a record and my A goal was 40,000, right? So this is like, I really want to make a great record. And my B goal, knowing of course, I'm going to have cost of paying for perks and the fees that come out of it. So I'm not keeping that 40, but by the time you all shake down, let's say it's 40. Well, I, I would typically go live with a goal of 20 because then you know, as you pass that threshold, you can build into the next threshold and continue momentum late into the campaign and see more and more benefit. Now this is really only, and actually a lot of Patreon users are doing this now as well, where they have goal benchmarks where they'll say, okay, if, you, if we get this many supporters, I'm going to release this special product that doesn't exist otherwise and, and so on and so on. So it's sort of the same sort of value add stuff Andy was talking about in the beginning. Um, but even if you're doing a timestamp campaign to set your campaign up where if you have an A goal and you start with your A goal and you haven't planned beyond that and your A goal is very ambitious, uh, it, I have found it better to be more conservative and go, okay, I'm going to go for 20. I, I still am in a great position to make a record if I raise 20 grand as opposed to 40 grand. And when I hit that 20 grand, I now know what my next level is going to be. And by that point is that's really where I see, and this is true. So one factor that doesn't get mentioned in my byline is I've owned a marketing agency for the last 12 years. So one of the things that, and we've worked with NBC, World Vision, lots of companies that some of you heard of, some of you haven't, um, but we do multi-channel, you know, full stack marketing. And one of the things you find when you run, say, a sale on e-commerce is that something like 60 or 70 percent of your transactions are going to happen in the last 48 hours of your sale. And it's that sense of urgency, that fear of loss or that kind of that there's a relationship to time. I found the same thing with our uh, kind of momentum building around these lines. You know, if I drive a twenty thousand dollar line, well, all of a sudden you see a huge burst of people who love the pile on effect. They love being a part of that thing that is successful and they feel like they're included and that's really good, particularly if you take that seriously, like Andy was saying, and build community around that. Um, so kind of maybe, it, I don't know, I, I never thought of it as manipulative to be honest, but but it, but yeah. it, I, I sort of intended it to be like, well, I mean, one way or another, I have these goals. I don't lose in these situations. If I only raise 20, I'm still in a great situation. People are still getting what they wanted and their value out of it. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, so I sort of would set multiple goals so that my realistic goal is easily achieved and yeah. it helps the momentum. 
Yeah, we, we have another approach we do kind of, you know, with this ongoing way of, of doing fundraising. You, you yeah, go which is different. Goal. Like we, we call it the rapid fire approach. So you might say, I'm, I'm raising funds for my single. You know, you start off and you raise whatever, $1,000 for your yeah. single. And then you've, you've funded that from literally just like, we, we've had people do that and they do that in a day. You know, it happens on day one. And then the momentum is great. I've funded my single now i'm funding the album and so it gives them a kind of step forward into that and um you know so, so there's various different ways that you can get the dynamic right using different tools or, or like we have it's kind of all in one uh tool with rocket fuel but i, th I think yeah we're, we're working mostly with artists starting out they're not doing seventy five thousand dollar kind of campaigns you know we've, we've had six figure campaigns uh through rocket fuel but they've been kind of been a slower build and it's you know we've had one artist hit that that kind of level and we've had quite a lot of people you know raising funds for albums but often it, it is people kind of starting out with a right an ep project or something uh you know as a, as a starting point really so uh, i think that's the great thing with crowdfunding it works at that kind of level from people who've been with major labels and it works you know we've had we've had projects where people have literally never released a song and you know they're doing their first project and they raise the funds for it we had a girl actually who wrote her first ever song and she wanted to record it and she, it was it was an awesome song it was really good i introduced her to a radio plugger um and he liked it a lot and he took it to the bbc and it got played on radio 2 which is the biggest radio station in the uk her first single she'd funded it through uh through rocket fuel and um you know so it's amazing what can happen you know from you know, very kind of humble beginnings, but crowdfunding is a good, it's a good way of doing things. You know, people, ha I see kind of, you know, seven ways that artists can fund their careers. They can self fund, you know, they can pay out their day job or their part-time job. They can, you know, they can invest from their earnings, which, you know, if, if you out gigging and touring, yeah, you might be making some, but if you're starting out, you're not going to be making much. You can look for grants. I know, in Canada, you seem to have quite a lot of export grants. I, I meet a lot of musicians at international events. So I'm, the Canadian government sent me here, you know, and yeah. that's great. Um, you know, you can you can look for investment, but that's difficult unless you have a viable business plan. Um, you know, there's, there's various different ways that you can look to raise funds, but crowdfunding is great because it brings you closer to the supporters, to the, the customers, and it helps people to think about what's my mission how do I articulate that mission? And it helps them think about their offering, you know, because mm -hmm. with most crowdfunding, unless you're just doing a GoFundMe and asking for donations, you, you have an offering, you have to present to people music, merchandise, experiences, and see what people want to buy, what they want to part with their cash for. Um, and that's a really important thing, because a lot of artists don't think, they think about the music, they think about performing, they think about you know, maybe trying to connect with an audience, but they don't think about, you know, what will people want to hang on their walls or what kind of message would they like to wear on their t-shirts or, you know, what services could I offer them that might be an experience for mm. a supporter. And I think, I think when you do crowdfunding, you learn so much as an artist about what people want, what people don't want. Nobody wants a mug with my face on it. You know, that's not going to sell the, there's enough tat in the world. You don't need to produce like tacky merchandise. That's not going to sell. But for me, I, I've crowdfunded and the thing I've sold is mostly is my services mm. because they're the things that people will pay, you know, they have to pay a lot of money for the kind of things that I do, consulting, recording, artist development, all that kind of stuff. People will pay for that and people are more inclined to, to you know, spend money on those things when they see actually behind my business, there's actually a mission and there's a ministry as well. So, so that's been, for me, a really good way of, you know, envisioning people who are potential customers for me through using my own crowdfunding. Well, you, uh, you were talking about goals. What's a realistic goal for a startup artist, a person that's just, like you said, they just, they're, they're, they got a song and they want to record it and they need the money. So what would be a realistic goal for them um, to start with if, if, it's, if that can be monetized through? <laughs> I, I would suggest thinking about, you know, how many people do you think you might get involved and what have you, what have you got to offer really? So I, I, as, as I said before, you know, it's, it's not unusual 
to get a hundred dollars per supporter or you know if you said fifty dollars per supporter and you thought about you know really low low priced offerings and we try and encourage people to have something in every price bracket because you know you might get someone like you know uncle uncle jim who's who's got the yacht in the bahamas you know he might just buy the thousand dollar experience you know and that might be the the goal hit in you know 10 minutes we've seen that happen before um so i i think there needs to be a little bit of planning in terms of like what are you offering and then how many people do you think might support you some some artists have a little bit of a following when they're starting other people might be part of a huge family and that can help some people might just have a great social network other people might be part of a church community um and if you can imagine you know 20 people supporting you for and 50 dollars is a a good average kind of ticket per supporter there's a thousand dollars you know um so i i tend to try and help people think think about it a little bit like that um but it it very it really does vary from from person you know person to person we've seen people do incredibly high amounts per supporter we've seen other people you know really capture people's imaginations with their campaign get other people involved we've had some people who attract you know support from other supporters on our platform as well you know some people just love supporting crowdfunding campaigns and they they look at different things that are launched and and it's a way they discover new artists as well Elias, what are some of the th elements that you have used to have successful um, successful crowdfunding campaigns? What are some of the things that you have done outside of, of collecting money before you actually go live? Right, yeah. So, uh, and again, I, just to clarify, we never collected money before going oh, live. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, I've started. I'm sorry. Like, yeah. <laughs> no, no, it's, no I, I don't know how I said it, but that we, we basically just nurtured relationships prior to campaign. Um, so, uh, well, one thing I think that's really, really important, and I absolutely take this from Andy saying, I don't know of a successful crowdfunding campaign, despite appearances perhaps, that just sort of happened on its own and was a success. So in, generally speaking, somebody is putting a lot of effort into it. Well, maybe it's not the artist, maybe it's someone like Andy coming along as a champion for that artist. But in, in every case, every successful crowdfunding campaign I know of has planning involved, has networking involved, has kind of drumming up intentional support. Um, as far as like actual work involved, I think, and, and it, again, this is sort of echoing a lot of what Andy's just said, um, but is really figuring out how to articulate your story in a way that connects with other people. I think it's really tempting to uh, do that and to essentially be almost myopic or, or totally kind of self-centered. And I think it's important to say, hey, what, is, what parts of my story align with the values of the people who are really going to be behind me? And so it's not an issue of lying or, you know, but it's saying, hey, if, I, if these are true of my story, and this is really important to these people, I should share those things. I should make sure that I connect those dots for people. Um, I think being really practical has helped us in the past where when it came to the bus, um, we... We had a, a admittedly a very real situation where Eric had had leukemia and couldn't rough it in the van with hotels. I mean, it just wasn't going to work. Um, so for him to continue, we had to raise a we had to raise money for bus. So that was a factor. Um, explaining the math in a fun way, we made videos that were kind of animated videos that explained how the numbers crunched out, and we used video in every campaign to kind of intentionally tell the story. Um, and you can go about that different ways. Uh, same as Andy, I think very, uh, multiple price points. I think that can, it can be tempting. There's a point, depending on your audience, probably, there's a threshold for that as well, though, where you can kind of give people price paralysis or choice paralysis. And so I think it's important to think through at different price points. What the, the biggest surprise for me, um, and again, this, I don't know how this would work for an up and coming artist, but. For established artists, I know this is fairly common and it was my best seller in terms of volume, not necessarily in terms of dollars, but in terms of volume, uh, was handwritten lyrics. People wanting me to write the lyrics to a song by hand and ship them that piece of paper for them to frame or framed for them. Um, so that, you know, it, it really, I think diversity of options, trying to capture people's different interests. And I, the big thing for me continues to be, uh, 
figuring out what your highest value experiences or options are. What can I do that someone would pay thousands for? And if so, if you're trying to raise money for an album and you want it to be, you know, studio label quality album, I mean, in reality, that's going to cost you. Just mixing that album alone is going to cost you anywhere from four to ten thousand. That's just mixing. So if you don't have a studio and you don't have a, I mean, you're going to pay for a studio quality album, right? Unless you're a producer, which is great. So, you know, it, you're, it's worth thinking through, thinking bigger in a sense and going, okay, what does it look like for me to come up with 10 grand or 20 grand in order to make this happen to the best of its ability and think creatively in terms of those networked relationships, in terms of what part of what I did in one thing was uh, I had shows where I might charge X to go up and show up with a band. Well, as part of the fundraiser, I just did it where I, char I it was the same value that it would cost to bring my band in, but it was just me. And they did that knowing that that was in support of my record, but they still got a concert out of it. So now obviously I then have significant costs. I mean, it would cost me a lot of money to get there, right? Um, but nevertheless, my net profit was very substantial compared to what a person might have paid for a vinyl, right? Um, and it, it's a lot easier to work with that core audience and then build on um, a niche with momentum than it is to be constantly trying to expand your $1 items. I think that's the like, trying to chase down 7,000 people to give you a dollar is a lot harder than chasing down five who will give you good money and then a bunch that can tag along. So I, I have a product on my crowdfunding page for, I, I have a crowdfunding page for Homegrown Worship. So that's the community in which we, we help writers, artists, and churches to share their songs. And we do it at a huge concession. Uh, so it's, essentially it has been the first couple of years, it's been a loss making exercise. Um, but on our crowdfunding platform, we, ha we have a product that's 12,000 pounds and you can sponsor a whole playlist where we help to release new song, a new song every month from a new artist. And no, no one's bought that yet, but you know, one day, maybe someone right. listening to this, to this, uh, broadcast um, might come along and just you know like, like I said it's I'm not going to get 12,000 people buying a you know a one pound product it's not it's not going to happen at this stage but you know one person who catches the heart of what we do with homegrown worship you know I know I know people who that would be very achievable for them to do that that wouldn't mm -hmm. be a sleepless night you know mm -hmm. them having to stump up 12,000 pounds for something um, I think when you connect with people on a, on a kind of head and heart level, which is what you can do with, with crowdfunding, they, they get to see your vision, they get to see what you're about, what you're building, uh, your mission as an artist. Um, it, it really helps. And the thing is that the arts, you know, it, it wasn't a commercial kind of industry until relatively recently in history. Um, you know, the arts were always kind of funded by patrons, by you know, wealthy business people and kings mm -hmm. and earls and all that kind of thing, because commercial music was kind of an invention that kind of came along with the concert halls and the gramophone. Um, prior to that, it was very much something that was supported because it's art is so important for culture and we need to look after the musicians. You know, we need to look after those who are doing, you know, music for society and music in the church as well. And I think that's something perhaps people are coming around to and crowdfunding's helped people to understand you know understand that the artist needs support to pay their bills and if if i'm a if i'm a songwriter and i have to go and work at the bank you know nine to five every day i don't have the time to hone my craft i don't have the time to share my work and make my masterpiece and share that with my community um and i think when people when people tune into that that's when they pull out their their credit cards and debit cards and they say yeah i want to support this person because they're meant to be doing this this ministry this vocation of music and i don't want to see them give up on their dream because their songs mean something to me um there's a really there's a really famous or very successful video in the kind of crowdfunding circle there's a, a lady called amanda palmer she she ran a the biggest music crowdfunder on kickstarter at the time uh, she raised over 1.2 million dollars um and it's a fantastic video. So, you know, I can't condone all of her, you know, activities and lifestyle choices or anything, but she's a fantastic artist. And I, I really respect what she has to say. And she talks about the fact there's this exchange with, with art, you know, when, 
when you present your your music to someone when you present what you have to offer there's an exchange that takes place and you know essentially you're just kind of you're kind of allowing people to reciprocate their enjoyment of what you're doing you're kind of passing you know passing the hat round, and there's an opportunity for people to contribute and, and people want to contribute it's not a one-sided thing with crowdfunding it's not begging you know if, if you think it's begging you're going about it the wrong way it's an opportunity to give to people to give more of your art give more of your music as an opportunity to give your services experiences and people will reciprocate that and they want to facilitate that it's amazing i've had people I've had people thank me, you know, they've said, Andy, I'm so grateful that you helped this artist get on rocket fuel. So I got to enjoy this day in the studio, or I got to enjoy writing a song with this artist, or I got to sponsor their new video. It looks amazing, you know, and it's quite counterintuitive because we all think, you know, oh, no one has any money because, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a musician, you know, I'm, it's, it's hard making money through all of my musical endeavors. Uh, but there are people who, you know, this, who love, there's a joy in giving uh, much more than receiving. And there's so many people who love to give. And what I like about crowdfunding is it gives them that opportunity. Mm -hmm. Mm. Okay, let's walk through something. How difficult is it to set up a crowdfunding page? Is, is uh, setting up a crowdfunding like, you know, sort of like writing a song? You need the verse, the chorus, the whatever, the bridge, the free chorus. How, is that, how do you put together a crowdfunding page? Uh, maybe for a rocket fuel, you could probably walk us through that. But for Elias, let me ask you, um, what would you, what would it be like setting up a crowdfunding page? Yeah, I mean, so the truth is that, and I'm sure rocket fuel is the same. The a lot of these platforms at this point are pretty established. They've been going for quite a quite a while, you know, um, and so they make it awfully easy. So, like in other words, they to some degree, kind of tell you what you need to do. But generally speaking, uh, you, need to, you need to figure out what sort of perks or what sort of benefits your supporters are gonna have, and those can range. And very often, I would say, make those sustainable and affordable for you as the artist. I have learned the hard way what it means to offer a perk that's expensive to fulfill and then only find that you ended up not raising nearly what you hoped on that particular item. Um, do a, a lot of the work that's really really essential to this is sort of like a little bit it's like a lot of things it's a lot of it's kind of high level and then there's the sort of really practical right and the stuff that's often missing you can do all the practical things and be talking past people and some in my experience like it's really really important to, and i hate to hammer this home again but it's really really important to get those sort of vision and and connecting with like like andy said head and heart with people uh, up front before you start and maybe even doing that while you set up the page maybe take your time while you set up the page if you're doing it through indiegogo or kickstarter or patreon start your account and poke away at it and mess with it and then send it as an example before you go live send it to some friends that you trust to say hey does this connect with you um or maybe even someone who isn't a don't ask your mom you know your mom's not going to tell you what, what's <laughs> really going on yeah. you know so send it to somebody who you're not that close to but say hey could you do me a favor i'm doing this does this compel you does this persuade you does this do you does this connect with you what about this do, you know and 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 ask for honest feedback almost like a miniature focus group mm -hmm. um is what is one thing i would do and once you've got those things done and you feel like okay i can send this to a stranger who shares my values and that stranger gets excited then don't hide it under a bushel that's that's the biggest thing for christian musicians i find is this sort of i think it's really really important to be humble and to stay humble in your faith and as a as a person in in your relationships with others but if god has given you a calling and a mission and a dream and you feel compelled to write songs or do whatever you're doing in such a way that people need to know if God's giving you a voice that and you feel compelled to not keep it in your kitchen, right? Then, then you shouldn't be embarrassed to go on social media and say, so you shouldn't be embarrassed to send a press release to new release today and GMA and GMI hub and everybody else. Cause it, at, at some point you're, you're saying, Hey, a stranger who, loves Jesus and believes in doing things for the, for the good of the kingdom of God and, 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 and to share this incredible gospel story with the world. Well, 
those people are all over the place and you don't know where they're going to come from. I mean, I was just looking, I had, I had folks from all over the world support my campaign. And, and one of the things we did, and I'd love actually kind of be curious to hear what Andy said, we ran Facebook ads. So people who had watched or encountered some of what I had done other places, or maybe even artists similar to that, we created a little video that said, hey, here's who I am, here's this song, and I'd love you to be a part of that. And in my experience, I've, I've I mean, 60% of my uh, fundraising for the work volume one uh, came through Facebook, both paid and organic. So I think making sure that you have a plan on the way in, you have your big picture, that you research, like test your campaign before you go live with people who aren't your mom, and then figure out how am I going to scale the reach of this once it starts to have people who are on board. Um, and maybe that, maybe that means a few emails or some playlists. I mean, there's a lot of different ways you can do that. But I, 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 you know, I, don't, I just don't think if, if you're sincere that this is something God's given you to do, I don't think you should sit on it passively. Unless you feel that that's specifically what God's telling you to do, to do it in faith. And if, 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 if that's sort of instruction or something, fine, great. But generally speaking, I think being a good steward of the gifts that God has given you means, means getting over yourself in a sense and saying, hey, I'm going to share this with people and I'm okay with that and figuring out how to do that most effectively. So Andy, t talk to us a bit about uh, Rocket Fuel. How, how do you sign up for that, for instance? Yeah, so, so we have a couple of different routes, really. You can sign up kind of free of charge on the site. You know, you can just go in and we have a mission builder, which kind of takes you through the process of getting set up and then it gets submitted to our team and then we look over it and feedback. But what, what we've actually found is has been most helpful because a lot of people have, um, you know, a lot of questions when they're doing it. They've not, they're not doing, you know, they're doing it for the first time perhaps, or they've tried it before and it hasn't quite worked. Not everyone is as smart as Elias. He's just, he's just like, he's, you know, so sharp and, and everything. So what, what's simple to someone who's very tech savvy could be quite complex to someone who's a little bit nervous or hasn't, hasn't done it before. Anything that's unfamiliar is going to scare people. So, so we've actually put together a, basically a training academy. We take people th through a four week program. And this is something new that we're doing as we kind of relaunch rocket fuel. Um, and we take them through basically, you know, what is crowdfunding, you know, how to articulate their mission. So we help people think about their wider mission. You know, can you sum that up? What's your purpose as an artist? And then how do you condense that down into what should your first goal be? You know, what's your first step? And then we take people through the mission builder, you know, how they, how they build a campaign, how they think about, you know, like Elias said, you know, you don't offer things that are hard to deliver. You know, that's one of the things that I've, mm -hmm. I, you know, we do things a little bit different to Patreon because I've seen people with nine different levels or, you know, loads of different levels of Patreon. And I know firsthand how difficult it is to keep organize dispatching and doing the admin for all these different tiers. So we keep it really simple at Rocket Fuel. We do three subscription tiers mm -hmm. uh, and we just make that a mandatory thing because it then makes it so much easier for the artist to um, deliver those things. You know, if you've only got one supporter at so much a month, you don't want to be like having to produce a whole live stream for that one supporter. So there's, a, there's quite a lot of thought that goes into um, particularly the recurring rewards. And that could be where you really get that ongoing relationship with, with fans. And then we show them the kind of um, mission control where we have additional tools that help people to, you know, get their campaigns running really well. And then we show people how to, you know, how to run a successful campaign and how to market things and, you know, how we help one artist raise a hundred thousand pounds through the platform, how we've helped other artists who, you know, have no following to, to build things up. And then, then we show people different ways to market through, you know, creating, you know, kind of funnels for their fans and all these kind of things. So, so we do this over a four week training program. It's kind of a facilitated program. But the beauty of our uh, learning platform we use is that it's all done on your own time. So you have a facilitator who inputs. Uh, so you're not just doing like an e-course on your own. You're getting interaction from, from a member of our team. You get to interact with a, another group as well. So other people who are setting up and getting, getting ready. Um, but it's all on your watch. So you log in, watch the videos, post your video questions. You respond on a video forum. 
um, and it's all it's all really nice. So that's that's a program we we're starting. Up. We're going to be running these kind of each month uh, to take artists through. Um, and yeah, it just it just helps to answer those questions that people have and to help people think about things that they haven't thought about. Because if you get if you get a really good idea and a really good way of working, it can it can help things move so much more quickly. Like we had, you know, one artist that you know they raised fifteen hundred UK pounds on their first campaign, but then they really got in the swing of it, and then over a few more years they they'd raised nearly twenty thousand pounds through through the platform. Uh, just because they were they were kind of fine tuning what they're doing as they're going, so we tr we try and give people the, the the technology, the techniques, and then also we we show them the success stories, not not just the big ones, but we show them the success stories for people maybe who are at a level similar to where they are. We show them the kind of grassroots techniques that might help them to build their mailing lists. A lot of artists with social media now they don't build their mailing lists. You know they have no they don't own any data. And that's really difficult. Fatal flaw. Yes. It's it's just it's so simple, but you know, through things like MailChimp, which you can sign up for for free, you know, two thousand users, you can have a free account. You can then do automated email journeys for people. You can welcome mm -hmm. them and give them a bite size, you know, bite size introduction to who you are over five emails. You can then do behavioral emails, and you know, if people are interested in you know your mail outs you can take them a little bit deeper and not just mm -hmm. get everyone with things um and then you can get to know who that core audience is so we we try and teach people how to do that you know how to uh, you know distinguish between crowd community and core and i think when people do that it helps them to focus their energy because everyone's kind of busy trying to get the likes and that they focus often too much on the crowd Mm -hmm. And the core can get neglected. And like Elias yep. said, you know, if you can nurture those relationships with key sponsors and donors and, you know, those who really believe in you or those who, who have the sway or the, or, the, or the deep pockets to make a huge difference, um, it makes so much sense. You know, businesses have key account managers. They know who their customers are and spend time on nurturing those relationships. Whereas a lot of artists get drawn into the, you know the busyness of social media which can be very distracting um and like i said earlier you know you don't necessarily need a huge fan base you might just need a group of committed friends who would actually get on a level with you and support you in your new ep project and that well, i think wasn't that something amanda palmer actually said at one point was that you you really only need one thousand true fans to make a full-time living at music i mean at some point it's it's manageable if you can get to that point and it seems impossible i know you mentioned about spotify earlier in the beginning it it seems impossible to think oh how would i get a million streams a month so that i'm making five thousand dollars a month at this like that seems like a really hard to imagine goal but thinking can i find in the next three years a thousand people who really believe in what i'm doing most people could probably at some point go yeah i i could see but maybe not all the steps are there and actually, I love what you're doing with that program. But, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's a bite-sized number in comparison, right? It's like, oh, I, I could yeah. think of how I could reach 1,000 people and get 1,000 people on board. And, and if your goal is 1,000, then setting a goal of 100 is even more achievable. It's like, oh, I could, you know? So, I, I, yeah, I think that's really, really great. And I, I love the way that you're walking people through that. Um, I think that's, that's some really important stuff. So kudos to you. How long should you run a campaign? Like... Is there a point where you say, okay, you know, it's been going on too long. I got to pack this in. 27 days is the, the research suggests. Mm -hmm. I think that's some research Kickstarter did. They, they said 27 days is the optimum time for a campaign. Wow. Um, I was going to say the same thing. <laughs> yeah, there we go. About mm, 27 and a half. Um, yeah. No, I, th I think I think if it's less than that, if it's a big goal, it's going to be hard to get it on everyone's radar. Um, we encourage people between four to six weeks, really, you know, sometimes people are a bit nervous to do it over four weeks because they think it's going to be over too soon. But if it gets over six weeks, the problem is you sometimes you, you get this kind of lull in the middle. Um, you know, the, the end of the goal, like Elias said, you know, you get the momentum of people jumping on board or piling on when it gets hit, or you've got this pressure of the deadline and people think, oh, I'll get around to doing it. And I think a month is really good because people think okay oh, it's, it's finishing this month or it's, it's finishing soon 
I'll, I'll get my credit card out and I'll just do it now. Whereas if you think, oh, it's in eight weeks time, you think oh, I'll come back later and do it. And I think in terms of as an artist trying to get support, you know, you want to make it really easy for people. Um, and also you don't want to fatigue, you know, your, mm -hmm. your mailing list, social media followers and all of that kind of thing. Because if you're hammering a crowdfunding campaign for three months, they will get very tired. They'll get fed, yeah. they'll switch off, they'll unsubscribe um, and all that kind of thing. So I think getting the dynamic right is, is really, really mm -hmm. important. I agree. Like the one month is a great time if you can, and to sort of pair it with something I said earlier, if you can make it so that you think you might hit your goal, again, not your like best case scenario goal, but your kind of A level goal, your basic goal, um, a couple of weeks in, that gives you two weeks for the pile on effect instead of leaving that for the end of a campaign. One thing I would say, in, in addition to what Andy was just saying, um, is if you have a mailing list, and I should hope if you're an artist that you're developing one, I mean, if, but if, if you have a mailing list, you have social media, he's right. You go three months and you're just hammering people about this campaign constantly. That's nothing but short of annoying. But I've also seen the opposite be true, where folks send one email and don't realize that the majority, the truth is most people aren't aware of what you're saying. I mean, other than your crowd or you really actively seek out, not, not your crowd, your core, other than your core, the crowd itself it might take five or six times of you saying that you're doing a fundraising campaign before they go, I'm sorry, did you say something about fundraising? I mean, there's sort of this, like, I think in, in marketing, they say it's anywhere from seven to 15 times people need to be exposed to your brand or your offer before they even realize that there is a brand or an offer, not even about them considering it. So there is a degree of repetition that is necessary that yes, your uncle or your buddy from high school might say might make a sideways comment at some point oh you're really talking about that campaign a lot the truth is most people aren't them i mean that's your core you have your core supporters you've got your snarky commenters sure but most of the people need to hear it a lot of times to even realize that it's happening and so having that one month sort of gives you the opportunity to do that in a concentrated way mm -hmm. uh avoid being annoying of course although that's a tricky balance to find mm -hmm. um and yeah, that artificial end, I think that pile on effect is really important. So I would, that's partly why we would do things the way we did in terms of mm -hmm. trying to figure out if we had big donors who would come alongside us so that we knew we were hitting our goal early enough to really maximize the potential of what happens after you hit your benchmark goal. I think that'd be one of the challenges that I would see as an artist. If I was trying to fundraise, I can, I'm hammering away at, oh, you know, and everybody's like, would you stop bugging me about this? But, uh, yeah. Well, and I think it's really about delivering value though. I mean, we worked with an artist to grow his Patreon uh, on the agency front. This isn't something I did as an artist, um, but he was doing these incredible guitar covers of songs, right? Mm -hmm. And so we started to figure out, okay, if you're gonna do some Rush songs, do a whole video of Rush songs, and then just don't be afraid to mention in the middle and at the end, hey, I have a Patreon, I do stuff like this, next month I'm gonna, I have three coming up. And you see this now with podcasts a lot too, where folks will say, if you want to help, I'm doing this on my Patreon, if you want to help me choose my next topic, or, I'm going to do another night of covers. It, it, you can choose between Gordon Lightfoot and blah, 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 right? And my Patreon supporters get to choose. So head on over to Patreon. That simple call to action, when you're in the middle of delivering value, you're giving them this incredible concert experience on live or whatever you're doing. I mean, that that's not annoying. That's that's saying, hey, this might have been free on the internet. It, didn't, it wasn't free for me. My time's worth something. We Can we do something together? And if you want to help me choose, if you want to play a role in shaping this, mm -hmm. head on over there and, and become part of that community because it sort of has all of that baked in. I think when it comes to marketing in general, but you know, I, I focus on crowdfunding, you can do three things. You can shout at people, you can bore people, or you can romance people. And I think mm -hmm. we'd all rather be romanced than shouted at or bored. Mm -hmm. And I think the thing to do is you've, you've got to think about how you tell the story and it's, it's, it's giving the ask, it's giving the direct appeals and the calls to action, you know, I need your help, need your support, but it's, it's having some fun around a particular product and spotlighting that and saying, you know, I had so much fun creating, you know, we, we had an artist uh, called Alistair, Alistair Griffin. He's just raised 20,000 pounds through rocket fuel. And 
he makes lemon curd, you know, and it's, it's a thing that his fans know he, he makes lemon curd. So when he talks about lemon curd, it's kind of like people know where to buy it from, but it, it's not just him asking, you know, give me money, give me money, give me money. That would be boring and that would switch people off. So I think you have to be creative, you know, when, when sending out your information, it has to be kind of 75% entertainment. You know, a lot of artists don't get that with their mail outs. They think it's just, inf it's just sending out information. But I think if you can learn to entertain the audience, marketing becomes so much more fun uh, and intuitive uh, for creative, you know, for creative artists who are, a lot of the time scared to ask for help because they, they want to be taken seriously or they're mm -hmm. like, oh, you know, I just, I just want people to value my music and, you know, but, but actually I think when you, when you can get over yourself a little bit and when you can learn to ask creatively and learn to, you know, market effectively, it's, 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 it is a lot of fun. I've had so much fun with, with campaigns, mm -hmm. uh, you know, just giving like your subscription tiers, like a really silly name and stuff. It, it can, it can just really make it lighthearted for people. And it takes a lot of the sting out of the, the pressure of having to, you know, ask people for help. But, you right. know, I think so many people do want to help. So it's, um, it's definitely worth pushing through the pain barrier to get that help you need to get that fuel in the tank for your next leg of the journey. Well, I think too, like artists have a tendency to, uh, and I say this as an artist, uh, to posture, to try to, build a construct of the version of themselves that they want people to like as a recording artist or something like that. And I think it's a kind of exhausting way to live. So I think it's really a, one of the benefits of, I think, going, hey, what does it look like for me to be myself in a way that connects with people who are alike to me? So to be transparent in what I care about and what's, what's important to me, sort of like the lemon curd thing, is it's like at the end of the day, you're building connections with people for what you're already doing, for what you're already passionate yeah. about. You don't have to pretend to be something. That's, that's, that's bad marketing. Bad marketing is pretending to be something you're not, whether that's a product or a person. Good marketing is figuring out how to effectively and maybe even efficiently be honest and share what's really important in your, in your like that, that sense of mission, that sense of core values. Um, that that's really where marketing shines. And so I think for artists, it's a really hard hill to climb because we grow up on all these, you know, oh, we think of that one press shop from the artists we love growing up, or we think of the different ways that people, you know, posture themselves. And, and I think there's a degree of that that's inevitable, but I, but I think on some level, it's really important to say, hey, you know, I, I want to bring people along who actually appreciate what I have to bring to the table and not some version of it that I invented to feel cool on Instagram, you know? Audiences want to see the real person, mm -hmm. which is so ironic. Cause like you said, artists, artists will say, Oh, I have to have a certain image, but the audience goes, who are you? And, right. and I think in this day and age with, with the advent of social media, um, it, it's given a platform for people to just be real and, you know, like, like you said, talk about the lemon, <laughs> the lemon recipe or, 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 you know, for me, talk about my dog or something. I don't know. <laughs> like, you know, it's just, it's just one of those, it, it is, it is something that is um, for, from a, I'll say from an up and coming artist mentality, it is very easy to, as you say, posture, it's very easy to go, oh, but I have to have this kind of image, you know? So that's really cool. Like I've been just sitting here soaking all this information in, because what I was hearing was the need for a very good marketing plan, um, which I know that those words scare artists, but there's also the use your creativity to build in this area, which is really, mm -hmm. really, really cool. And get creative with what you can share. I mean, um, it's funny, you were saying, uh, Elias, that one of the, one creative thing you've done is is send your lyrics with your handwriting, you know, and, and people actually paid for that. They wanted mm -hmm. a framed version of your handwriting. And it made me go back to uh, when we had artist managers on and one stat that was actually said was people, um, artists, or I'm oh, sorry, people think that when artists are marketing themselves, it's their, it's their music it's their music that's at the forefront that's 90 percent when actually it's the opposite the the per, the people's music is like third you know third or fourth down the line it's people um wanting their pictures 
it's wanting uh, a signature, it's wanting, you know, something that's totally what people would not expect to be at the top of the line of when they're oh. selling something, whether it's online or in person at a concert. So um, if I can kind of jump towards a marketing, like, like in, in some ways, crowdfunding in a sense is like a marketing plan. Um, I know it's, yeah, it's one mo monetized marketing, basically. It's monetized marketing. So from a marketing perspective, Elias, what are some elements, um, if you can detail, well, or at least outline, what are some things that an artist should take into consideration? We'll just summarize it as... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, um, I mean, you can't control where someone will find you. So I think, it, but you also can't be everywhere at once if you're by yourself. Mm -hmm. So I think part of what's important is, again, this is going to sound kind of like, not, it's not meant to be vague, but it, it is true. One of the most important things is to identify those core things instead of, so it, maybe this sounds like posturing, but I mean it more like filtering. I could talk about everything that is true about me, but all I'll do is confuse the people that are paying attention. So I think it's important to say, these are things I really care about and I'm going to focus there. And I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to talk about my music. And I, for me, I love Star Trek and science and Star Wars and all of the nerdy things. So I'm like, okay, well, I guess I'm going to start to, I mean, there was a time with City Harmonic. I would never have worn a Star Wars shirt on stage or, you know, my top selling t-shirt now as an artist, for example, is the chemical compounds for water and wine. Oh, really? Uh, so, <laughs> So I have a shirt, I have a t-shirt that says, you know, what is it? H2O into C26, whatever. I forget what it is right now. But, but basically, I, I, I whipped it up as a joke, posted it on Instagram and Facebook to say, hey, wouldn't it be funny if I did this and set up like a little drop ship t-shirt thing? And it's been my best selling shirt ever since. I'll, I'll go to a, uh, <laughs> play a show at a Southern Baptist church and I'll go in and I'll say, hey, I don't have to sell this if you feel uncomfortable with it. And they'll, they'll say... No, that's okay. And then I'll, and so I'll, I'll sell it and it'll go great. I had one church, they said no. And I said, good, great. I put it in the boxes. I put it away. Well, my volunteers were selling it under the table. It was still my top selling shirt. So <laughs> there's, there's this sort of like, that's awesome. Part of it, part of it Love is it. The, the earnestness of it. I think that's, people are just like, there, there's so much posturing that it was like, you know what? I, I, I'm probably not, I'm, I mean, I, I would think it's not good to be a drunk person necessarily, but I, I have no problem with a glass of wine. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a Methodist for Pete's sake. I mean, we put it in communion if we could. So there's sort of this, this sense of like, Hey, I, I, I think it's sort of important to be like, I'm going to wear it out there. It's a little bit of science, a little bit of Jesus working miracles and a little bit of, you know, earnest culture. Right. And, and that resonated deeply with people. And so I bring that up, not just for the sake of being funny, but as I think a lesson, it's like, it, it's important to say, Hey, what is true of me that is important and good and that I, it's worth sharing that I can talk about that will resonate with people who are like me? Because those are the people you want alongside you. You don't, you don't want a peanut gallery. I mean, although you want that in your close friendships, you want mentoring and discipleship relationships, but from like a crowd, so to speak, you want people who get excited about who you already are so that you don't exhaust yourself. And so I, I know that sounds really high level and kind of vague, but it, it, I can't think of something more important to do because you could go to Instagram and you could do some really basic tactics. Instagram growth, for example, is far more about what you do on other people's channels than what you post on your own. Nobody really talks about that. They'll tell you all about hashtags. It's true. Your hashtags matter nominally, but your, your feed, for example, is really about the conversion point. That's when someone comes to your profile, they follow you based on the content. They don't find you based on your content. They find you based on you being out there in the world. So no matter what, any, cha any of these channels, there are clever ways you can do things, you can spend money to grow, but at the end of the day, nothing will work better than finding things that are, you already value, that are already key to you, and that other people perceive in you that you might not even think are a big deal. This is where your friends can come along in a big way and communicating them in a way that resonate with people who aren't your mom. I mean, I, I, I you know, it, it, a lot of marketing comes down to this phrase from Seth Godin, people like us do things like this. Mm -hmm. And so if you can figure out your us, you're like, Hey, here's, here's my, my little micro tribe, you know, Christianity is a big world. 
well, what about the Christians who are kind of in the same space as me? What does it look like to build a community with these people and to be kind of transparent in that? I, I, yeah, I mean, I don't know, Andy, if you have something to add, but that seems to me the most important thing is really finding that resonating factor in two or three things. Yeah, I think I think that's great. You know, you know your stuff, Elias, and it's fascinating listening to that. It kind of made me think about the first ever crowdfunding campaign that I ran. It was in 2012. It was um, two sisters. I was I was managing. I just started managing them, Fern and Adrienne. They went by the name Daughters of Davis. And the thing that was fascinating about them is is you know they lived in a camper van. They bought a camper van off eBay. And two sisters traveling around in the, it was a it was a converted works van. It was not like a nice a luxury RV or anything. It was it was pretty gr- grotty. Um, and you know they wanted to make an album, and I said, okay, okay, we'll make an album, but we need to tell the story because the story of them living in the van was the thing everyone commented on. Their kind of name went before them. You know, kind of the the camper van sisters people would refer to them as. You know, they forget the name of the band, but they remember the story. Um, so I said to them, let's, let's tell this story. And, um, they lived in a van, they were living on kind of baked beans and, you know, noodles, you know, they didn't have any money. So I said, let's, let's try crowdfunding. It was this new thing that was, that was kind of happening. And I'd seen a couple of other people do it in other sectors. And we raised money to basically make a DVD about their life in a van. Mm -hmm. So we thought we called this DVD, we raised 1500 pounds. It was called music mischief and life in a camper van. And it basically took all of their footage they'd got from their digital SLR and we filmed a few interviews and um, it was this great little project. We got about 50 people or so got behind the the campaign. Um, But what happened after that was, was incredible. We got, um, we got a funding grant behind them so they could show the DVD in theaters and cinemas on a, a small kind of UK tour. We got them in the press. They were doing, you know, radio, they got on TV. And then we spoke to um, a leisure company called the Caravan Club in the UK, which is, you know, it's, it's not the most rock and roll organization, but has over a million members. And they loved the story. They took the DVD to one of the van companies that they worked with. And we ended up getting them as a sponsorship. They got a brand new compact motorhome given to them free of charge, like a, a brand new vehicle. And it was just, it was the catalyst for, you know, them going on, they, they went on tour with Eels, you know, really big band doing a huge tour. They went on tour with a couple of other household names in the UK, ended up playing at the O2 Arena in London. And, um, you know, it's really, it was the story that helped them to really build up their, you know, the kind of brand and following. And it all started with a crowdfunding campaign because uh, they decided to tell a story that only they could tell. And I think one of the things I try and encourage artists to do with their crowdfunding campaigns is think about the project that only you can do. Mm-hmm. You know, think about, think about a body of work that only you can do. I'm, I'm into different bodies of work. I, when I launched homegrown worship, I did a weekly release for 52 weeks. I, I made a compendium of worship songs, you know, 52 weeks. And I decided to do something a little bit different this year. I did a, an album which we wrote, recorded, and released in 24 hours, you know, because nobody else would do that. It's it's stupid, you know, but I do that because, you know, I'm, I'm up for the challenge. <laughs> so I think it's really good when artists think about projects that excite them, that only they can do, that starts to tell this story of, of who they are. And people get behind that because it's authentic. It's not, mm-hmm. it's not contrived. And like Elias says, that that's tiring for artists. If you're trying to be this Instagram supermodel that you're not, you know, I was joking with Elias earlier, you know, his Instagram's so much cooler than mine. <laughs> you know, I've got my kind of homegrown vegetables on mine and, you know, it's just, it's, I, I you know, I, I can't do that as well as he can do, but you know, there's, there's a story that I can tell that he can't tell. And I think there's, there's so much value in artists being real and, mm-hmm. and, you know, just, just putting, putting it out there and you might not appeal to everyone, but you find your people, you find your tribe, you find yeah. your community. Uh, and that's what we try and do, um, you know, with crowdfunding is it's a great, it's a great thing to have a go at. And whether you're raising a few thousand dollars or a hundred thousand dollars, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. I think it's just about, you know, giving people something of value and inviting them to support you and help you in your, mm-hmm. your mission as an artist. 
It, it's funny, that story. It reminds me of, um, I don't know if any of you guys saw this, back in 2017, there was a commercial made for a used 1996 Honda Accord with 140,000 miles on it. And uh, it was just this, they really sort of presented this, you know, uh, car as not a car, not a used piece of junk, but a lifestyle. You know, she had a coffee maker in the front seat and all this stuff. So this car was worth fifteen hundred dollars, right? In, according to Kelly Blue Book at the time, um, and in the end, they had offers on eBay for one hundred and fifty thousand. eBay canceled it, thinking it was a hoax, and then in the end, it was purchased by CarMax as an ad. So they for twenty thousand dollars. So they sold this car a used Honda Accord that almost certainly wasn't $20,000 new. Uh, they sold it for 20,000 used because they told the story in a way that was enrapturing and engaging and true. I mean, there was nothing about it that was a lie. It was essentially telling the truth in an interesting way and in a way that connected with people. Um, and I think that's what good marketing is. People often think it's, it's trickery and lies. And I don't think it is. I think it's, it's connecting with people on a deep level by telling the truth better. Um, and and he, Andy's right. You have your own story and, and no one can no one can take that from you in a sense. And in all likelihood with 7 billion souls in the world, there are probably plenty of people out there who would connect deeply with your story if you could figure out how to tell it. There's definitely a thousand, isn't there? Yeah, so <laughs> that's if right. That's all you, if that's all you need to find a thousand loyal supporters to get through, pay the bills, and, mm -hmm. you know, it's definitely, it's definitely possible. Fantastic. Well, thank you guys so much. We need to wrap up our time together. We've really, really had a lot of fun. Uh, this has been so amazing. Um, Andy Baker and uh, Elias Doomer, you guys, um, man, I, I didn't, I didn't know what to expect. We talked about fundraising. We talked about, well, this is how you accumulate funds, but to go into the, like Elias had a lot of, a lot of stuff, to throw out it that was really and cool. tangential attention i apologize for that no it's not at all. <laughs> the, the information you have is, is overwhelming it's amazing and and andy the, the system that you have set up mm -hmm. help artists in the system is commendable it's incredible mm -hmm. and so i just want to thank you both for being with us tonight it's been a real blessing no, really thank you who knew funding could be so fun <laughs> Did you did you think of that yesterday and write that down? Uh, I, I I I must have put it in a few subject lines. <laughs> putting, the, putting the fun in funding. There yeah. you go. <laughs> That's great. I yeah. echo what Dale said. I thank you, gentlemen, so much, and I thank you, viewers, for watching us. Um, I'm hoping that you are all encouraged about what was said, what Elias said, and what Andy said. That you can crowdfund your project. You don't have to start um, from the very top. <laughs> you don't have to start with, with everything in place, although it helps, <laughs> but you know, you can have a start and you can find, you can find your crowd. You can find your fans. You can find your, from the crowd, you can find your community and you can find your core. So that's what I got from all of this. Um, we will be back next week. Uh, it'll be our studio talk week. We'll be talking about mixing. So we look forward for you to join us then. But until then, um, I hope you have a great week. God bless and remember that Gospel Music Industry Hub encourages unity, community, mentorship, and talent growth. Thank you and good night. Good night. God bless everybody. Take care.